Hello, everybody. This is Bruno Hoffman and Keith Keller. We're co-hosting TheFourSeat.com. And today uh, we are privileged to have in the third seat, Leslie McCall- McClellan, and she's going to introduce herself in a minute. And we've got Walt Judas, who is the CEO of Tourism Industry Association BC. Hello, everybody, and welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. So, Keith, uh, you're in Melbourne, and uh, why don't you just kick the show off and introduce yourself and then introduce Leslie. Mm, yeah, so I'm, I'm um, Keith Keller, if you haven't heard me. I'm the Twitter dude. I live in Melbourne, Australia, and this idea of the fourth seat is a great example of what's possible with technology. We've got Canada, the US, and Australia represented in four squares. Uh, my very, very good friend, uh, Leslie McClellan from Lake Arrowhead, agreed to do the first one with us. I'm going to throw to her to introduce herself. She really is a a social media for tourism rock star. So, Leslie, tell me a little bit about what you're doing and how it relates to tourism. Well, thanks for having me. This is going to be really fun. I own a company called Just a Small Town Girl, and we provide uh, marketing for tourism and hospitality uh, clients. That means I'm in the trenches every day, day in, day out, you know, doing what everybody else is doing as far as tourism marketing goes. And then I also am partners in a company called Tourism Currents, and we provide online and in-person training for destinations and hospitality-based uh, organizations. All right. Well, we're sitting in Canada here, and I'm uh, actually sitting in a tourism destination spot, a place called Pender Harbor, and it's a place where people come and just relax, fish, and sail, and uh, take in the beautiful nature of West Coast, BC. And I love tourism because I'm a consumer of tourism, but I have uh, the privilege of introducing a good friend of mine uh, who I've known for a number of years, but also now in his role uh, as the CEO of Tourism Industry Association of BC, Walt Judas. And Walt, I'm going to hand it over to you just to give a quick introduction, and uh, then we're going to get started. Thanks, Bruno. It's uh, nice to be here, and I love tourism too. I'm passionate about it. I spent over 15 years at Tourism Vancouver in a marketing role uh, with a destination marketing organization. I'm still very passionate about the city where I was born and raised, but now I've gone from marketing more to the advocacy side, dealing with tourism issues that matter to operators, destination marketing organizations, sectors, and communities all around the province of British Columbia. Fantastic. Well, you know, the, uh, the concept of the fourth seat is that um, we've all done traveling. We've traveled in airplanes. We've traveled in taxis. There's a helicopter going overhead right now. <laughs> uh, this is the wild west coast. And uh, many times I've bumped into people like you have, and we've been able to share a conversation as we're going somewhere in a taxi cab. And so the fourth seat is very much uh, about uh, a conversation. So we don't have anything scripted here other than we know that tourism today, uh, with the size of the tourism dollar that's being spent, and I think Walt in your area, it's something like $13 billion. And then we've got um, all kinds of people involved in tourism, and they have a wide range of budgets. Some have a great budget, some have none. And then we've got this incredible channel to market, the internet, where Leslie, you've been able to train and uh, and help uh, other words exploit this. So, well, I'm going to pass it over to you because I think uh, you and I discussed something some time ago, but you were talking about the challenges that you face in promoting and helping small businesses, people who are just running a gas station, they're really in tourism, and they need to get exposed um, and, and get their businesses exposed. But I'll pass it over to you just to sort of kick things off on, you know, what you want to talk about in the, uh, the fourth seat. Well, first of all, one of the questions that I get wherever I go is, how is tourism doing in BC? And uh, the only way I can describe it is it's rocky. There's a number of factors for, uh, because of that, uh, or a number of factors that have contributed to that, including Canada is a safe place, it's a desirable place, it's easy to get to. Of course, the uh, low Canadian dollar helps. There are a number of factors. Uh, not the least of which we have a pretty good reputation on the international stage as a place to come and do virtually anything. So tourism in British Columbia, our province as a whole, the last couple of years has set records for number of visitors, number of international visitors, overnight visits, all the measures that people traditionally use in tourism. And it looks like this year is, is about to be the same. We'll likely set a record for the third straight year. So All of those factors, tourism is shaping up to be really good for the economy in British Columbia. I talked to the tourism minister recently who said there are three industries that have basically kept the province afloat over the past couple of years. Tourism is one, 
film and high tech are the other two. Wow. Which is here. At the same time, though, there are a lot of issues. We have a big province. It's the size of virtually Washington, Oregon, and California put together. There's a lot of areas of the province that are still hurting. And predominantly because we have a hard time getting labor. There is a job shortage or a shortage of people to fill jobs in British mm. Columbia. We predict that by 2020, there will be 100,000 people required to fill tourism jobs in the province. Some of that because of attrition, retirement, etc. but there are new products and services being created, and we need people to fill those jobs. And that's probably the number one issue, not only in our province, but virtually across Canada, as I heard from my provincial colleagues yesterday uh, when we were together in Ottawa. Is that something you see, Leslie, in the clients that you deal with or in your neck of the woods? And you, I saw you nodding your head when you're talking, when Walt was talking about how tourism has been such a booming business in British Columbia, because you've got some ties to Canada. You know what's going on here. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, from the state standpoint, of course, everybody wants to go to Canada because we do have a good exchange rate right now. It's, it's super to be coming up there. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. Film. When you mentioned film, uh, I'm not. Too, I'm about an hour and a half from Los Angeles. But just this coming weekend, I'm bringing up ten film location scouts that are from the major production companies in Southern California because that is absolutely a really strong market for anybody to be involved with. Um, and of course, you know, Canada and Vancouver in particular is taking a lot of our Southern California market. Um, understandably you know any time you can get involved in some sort of niche market it is so super and that's what communities seem to kind of miss the boat on they don't see that maybe they would be attractive to filming or they might be attractive to bird watching you know who knows what mm -hmm. in the tourism mm -hmm. industry but as a lot of times I find that some of these smaller communities of course they're gems but they're not focusing necessarily on what their strengths are. Do you see, do you, do you find that's something that happens in your neck of the woods, Walt? No question. Um, it's funny that you mentioned film tourism. Last week, uh, we hosted a summit at a place called Sun Peaks, which is uh, a mountain resort near Kamloops, British Columbia. It's about four hours from Vancouver or so. And one of the sessions was specifically on film tourism. We had film commissioners, we had somebody that studies film tourism. We had uh, a DMO or a destination marketing organization actually looking at what their strengths are and figuring out that a show that is being filmed in that community, it's Richmond, which is a, a bedroom community of Vancouver, a city in its own, own right with a couple hundred thousand people, has a show called Once Upon a Time. Oh, yeah. Filmed, yeah, it's filmed in Steedston, which is a great area. If you've ever been there, it's a wonderful place to go, and it's got a lot of character, but it's known as Storybrook. Well, they've now taken the notion of Storybrook and combined it with Richmond and Steedston and figured out there are people that want to travel from around the world just to see that location. And what they've done is taken it a step further to say, listen, we can leverage this, so why don't we put the filming schedule online, allow people to see when the show is being filmed, and that, in turn, attracts even more people to the community. They've gotten uh, merchandising rights and sell it right in Steveston. So they've leveraged what is a, a wonderful little spot in Richmond called Steveston. It's used for filming. They've leveraged that opportunity to draw attention to their destination, and they're doing it right because, to your point, they're building on their strengths, whereas many who have films in their community or television shows are completely missing the boat. Absolutely. But, oh, wow, I'm so glad you, you've talked about this because what a great case study. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to be able to, I'm going to be using that and talking about them because that's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, that it's interesting about um, talking about the employee need, the need to find employees. I don't see that so much in this, at least in California. Because, we seem to have plenty of tourism folks but you know tourism is such a fun job and and like even when you reference the gas station attendant good grief you know they're our best ambassadors aren't they i mean anybody that's a frontline person and i think 
so often they don't realize that they are really tourism ambassadors for us. They're an extension of all of our marketing departments, <laughs> more or less. And yeah, and, and as Bruno mentioned that, I thought about it. You know, if you're in a resort, and let's say the resort has a marina, the gas station at the marina is predominantly in tourism. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and, and yet people don't recognize it. And I think that's part of the issue. Uh, if you think about tourism, it's multiple sectors. And in some cases, people that are working in those sectors, the restaurants, for example, or retail, don't recognize that they're a significant part of the tourism industry. And that's one of the biggest problems. And it's why tourism has a difficult time, sometimes as an industry or as a business sector, getting the recognition that it deserves by government and decision makers when they're considering policy, et cetera. I'm sure you're familiar with this too, but that's part of what we need to do as a, a sector, a business sector, is educate people. Here are the range of jobs in tourism. They're not all low-paying jobs. There are some low-skilled labor required, to be sure. But in our province, tourism actually pays probably 30% more than minimum wage for people to start in the industry. So it's a good entree to getting some experience, but can lead to an exceptional career for many people. On the issue of, of labor, the summertime is when there's a student workforce that comes online and they're all looking for jobs. And I've heard through, uh, especially in Vancouver, it's hard to find jobs. So is, is, is there a, a gap that I'm missing with the, uh, this labor force that comes on in the summertime called the students? And there's uh, tourism booms higher, I, I would imagine, in the summertime, that there wouldn't be an opportunity to meld those two together. Well, theoretically, you're right. There should be an opportunity to meld those together. I think what's happened, what we've seen often, is that the types of jobs that are available, students don't necessarily want. You know, it's a lot of weekend work or shift work, or uh, perhaps in an area or a place that isn't convenient to where they live. And so those jobs remain unfilled. But there are some prime jobs in the summertime all over the province that and in absolutely amazing locations that are desperate for people if only they could get people to come a place like tofino which is world renowned for surfing and all of the outdoor activity and sports and the hiking and the beaches spectacular place the types of positions that they might have to fill in the summertime could be a chambermaid or somebody that washes dishes. And believe it or not, they can't seem to retain people in those positions. They might even try to attract them from across the country. And I've heard mm -hmm. stories about uh, hiring six people at a terrific resort. Not one of them lasted more than six days because mm. they found a work too hard. <laughs> can, I ask, can I ask a series of questions about this? I'm, I'm, very, sure. I'm very fascinated by this because I've just done a series of gigs in New Zealand and my friends in New Zealand in a lovely place called Kei Kora, which is famous for whales and lots of really lovely sea faring animals, find that there's a lot of what we call travel bloggers. There's these people that mm. actually travel around. They don't actually, they've sort of given up corporate life. And I know a lot of them because I've done a lot of traveling. And there's, I'm just wondering, is there, a, is there a way that people listening to this episode, and even if we extract this part, people say, for instance, who wanted to go to Canada on a working holiday, knowing that mm -hmm. there's actually jobs available, is, is there something that they can do to one, skill up? And two, how would they get the job? Say an Aussie from Melbourne, Australia, says, you know what? I'm selling my house and I'm traveling to North America and I don't know when I'm coming back. And I personally know several people that have done this. Mm -hmm. And they just turn up in a town and they say, well, what's going? I'll wash dishes. I'll pump petrol. I'll make coffee. I don't care because mm -hmm. tomorrow I'm going to the Rockies. Or I, I just saw an elk or I just saw a squirrel, you know, which, of course, you see all the time, but we don't have squirrels here. Ah. So... so Tourism or tourists, or in, in particular tourist bloggers, travel bloggers, travellers love to travel. They don't care how they go travelling. They don't, 
Mm. So I think the opportunity is getting someone who wants to go to BC to wash dishes for three days a week and spend the other days on a boat with Bruno or to come and uh, go up to Whistler or to maybe go to Kamloops. So what what your jobs were, or what skills do you think travellers could prepare for in order to get uh, to increase their likelihood of getting employment to keep their travel journey going? Well, it may not even be so much a function of the skills. It's the visa application process. You know, there's oh, one okay. for students that are working visas, etc. Okay. And in fact, if you go to the ski hills around British Columbia, filled with Aussies, Aussie Day is more popular than Canada Day. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the summer, you know. That's if you go to Whistler, you see the lineup starting at seven in the morning for Aussie Day. We have plenty of Aussies. They know the routine and and how to get here and how to extend their work visas to maximize the opportunity that they have. And we have a reciprocal relationship too, yeah. as Canada with Australia. So plenty of Canadians go to Australia to work. I think that that one of the things that employers are recognizing, and this is a good thing, is to your point, people don't necessarily want to come and spend every evening and weekend working. They want to experience the culture. They want to experience our supernatural province, whether they're mountain bikers or hikers or skiers or what have you. Mm -hmm. So part of the attraction now to try to bring people to British Columbia is to offer them an experience. So they come to work, and maybe it's three, four, five days, whatever it is. The rest of the time, it's making sure they're integrated into the experiences that they came here for. Exactly so it could, could be cycling. It could be whatever. There's a multitude of things that you can do here. But that's now part of the appeal, particularly to young people, is mm-hmm. – if, if we can use that as a hook, look at how great this is and look at the lifestyle that you can enjoy. We're even trying to do that domestically because if you go from coast to coast to coast, British Columbia is so vastly different than Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the Maritimes, etc. And that's, that's exactly the hook we're trying to use, Keith. Well, it's, it's, really, yeah. it's really quite amazing that you're saying this because when, when I was traveling, and I've done quite a lot of traveling, all of the people that I talk to, uh, when I was traveling around, most people were saying, you know what, I'd, I'd love a job. I love it here, but I've got to leave because I've run out of money. And mm. if we could give the travelers that will do anything, they'll, they'll, they'll wash dishes, they'll make coffee, they'll clean your car, they'll, they'll vacuum your carpet. I don't care what it is because they want to go to Whistler tomorrow or they want to get on the boat or they want to go to Victoria or, you know, go and have cucumber sandwiches at the Empress Hotel. You know, so that the, the actual job that they do is actually really irrelevant to them. They don't mind. It's not really even a task. It's 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 money in the bank for a, a, a swap of labour. So it's really quite a shame that you're having trouble because we, we have a, a large amount of people that are desperate for these jobs. we just got to find them. And, hey, Keith, can I flip that just a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm building a, a DMO for a region in Southern California that has no money. I mean, it's very, very, there's no funding really for it. And we are bringing, you're talking about bloggers, we're bringing bloggers in to for experience like six weeks at a time our destination. We put them up in a home and provide them with meals because we don't have money to pay them, but everybody chips in with the food and the lodging. And then they write about us on a regular basis, exactly and then right. they're giving us publicity. It's a win-win, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely is. So whether you um, are someone looking for a paid position or you might be a blogger that could help out a smaller destination, you know, it, it is. It could be a real win for everybody. But here's a parallel yeah. problem that – that um, we also have to consider in British Columbia. The major centers, by and large, you can find places to stay. You're looking at Vancouver, Victoria, but as you hit the resort communities, one of the barriers to attracting people is finding places for them to stay. Any long-term accommodation is now being used by those that are renting out through the likes of Airbnb or VRBO. So in as much as you might be able to attract somebody to one of the ski resorts, if they can't find adequate accommodation on site for a reasonable price, 
you just don't get them there. So yeah. it's, it's you're so right. Last night I took the owner of the marina here. He, he runs a little resort with some cabins uh, at the Pender Harbor Resort, and uh, he's it's now June, but he's maxed out, and he's got I think he's got about ten cabins and some tenting sites and uh, four hotel rooms, and and he says my biggest constraint is accommodation. He says I could build another six or eight cabins, and they would be book solid for the rest of the year. Mm. So you're absolutely right. These places people want to come here, if they don't want to stay in tents or sleep on the ground, they've got to find some place to stay. And uh, he said he said he'd love to have five or six or seven more cabins because he would fill them. Why don't we just go around the horn a bit and uh, and just summarize a couple of things, Leslie? I'm really I'm really keen about hearing how you have helped uh, some of your um, smaller budget communities promote their brand and using the internet is such a, a, a great um, a vehicle uh, and a low cost way of reaching out to the rest of the world to talk about your brand and your your product. So. You could share a little story. That would be great as an anecdote, and then we'll move over to Walt. Well, um, I'll, I'll use Lake Arrowhead, the community that I live in, because in uh, 2008, our budget was slashed to absolutely zero, and that was when I got involved with social media out of complete desperation. It wasn't because, you know, I thought I wanted to be cutting edge or anything like that. I had no other choice, and I marketed for two years Lake Arrowhead. Um, competing with Disneyland, the deserts, the uh, beaches, uh, but marketed solely with, via social media and primarily via Twitter and hashtags. And, you know, hashtags for any community, I believe, are a saving grace, but they have to, you have to get your community behind Twitter or behind Facebook, you know, to get them going. But uh, uh, you just can't beat social media. It's a total gift or no budget or small budget communities, for sure. Leslie, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, how can they get a hold of you as we wrap this up? Where can they find you? How do they get a hold of you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Leslie McClellan, and uh, then also email me at Leslie at just a small town girl. US. Well, just in summary, uh, I, we so appreciate your time uh, having, having uh, you know, spending time out of your, your day and your family time to be with us. But just in summary, a, a couple of things maybe in closing, and uh, I love the challenges you talked about today, and then how do people find out about uh, what's going on in British Columbia and tourism? Well, thank you for that, Bruno. I, um, I want to pick up on something that Leslie was just talking about and the social media angle. One of our goals as an organization is to see that tourism is recognized as one of British Columbia's leading and sustainable business sectors. And so most recently, what we've done is, is coined the handle of BC Tourism Matters or hashtag BC Tourism Matters. Mm, mm. And, That's great. Yeah, in doing so, we've actually had a lot of our members, the sectors and the DMOs and even the Minister of Tourism in the province start using that hashtag. So every time we do something that is significant for tourism, it's, uh, it's essentially broadcast via social media uh, using that hashtag. It's Tourism Week in Canada. And we did something specific in British Columbia where we invited every mayor of every community to do something in their own community around tourism. Maybe it's going to a visitor center, Maybe it's an airport, a cruise terminal, a major attraction. Greet visitors, welcome them to your community, invite media, talk about the importance of tourism in your community because it is it is the most competitive industry in the entire world because every county, every city, every province, every state, every country virtually in the world is in tourism. So let's show that it matters in BC. So we've started to use that hashtag and it's taken off and we had tremendous participation on Monday when we invited all the mayors to do uh, to to be part of this promotion, and we'd like to keep it going because that's how we're going to see tourism making a difference in the lives of individuals and within communities for investment purposes for the economy, all the good things that we know tourism delivers. Yep, and I'm going to go right to my tweet deck and make a column for uh, hashtag BC <laughs> Tourism great. Matters to follow it. That's great. Yeah. And how super, what a great way to get all your legislative people involved and all the communities too. I love it. Yeah, our um, our tourism minister loved the idea and uh, 
had all the, the members of the legislature do it, the mayor. So this is the first year, and next year it'll be even bigger and better. That's awesome. Wonderful. So this is the first of many, many uh, of these ideas to come. You can find out more at the, the fourth seat on Twitter. You can find out more at uh, www.thefourthseat.com. We're going to be featuring Walt and Leslie's wonderful interview as an audio, as a video, and as a transcript, so you can you can take part in whatever way you f you find. We'd love to hear what you think and who you'd like to have in the in the third and fourth seat. This is the first of many, many, many of these to come on. I'm so excited. It went so well. And we, we've had such, a, like, almost the ideal scenario for our inaugural session, wouldn't you think? I think so. And what I'm looking forward to is uh, having both of you participate again. Uh, if we can do this again, maybe in the off season in the wintertime and see what new challenges are there and, uh, and see if that, uh, you know, some of the, the hashtags that you're using will all working and uh, Leslie maybe we can drag you up to Canada and uh, bring some employees with you <laughs> fantastic <laughs> this was really super thank you so much you're very welcome thank you everybody and uh, we'll, let's sign it off now